Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Gagno Atelier. I'm your old pal, Tim Gagno, and this is the Modern Masters Podcast. Well, welcome to the show, everybody. I'm excited to have you here. We are broadcasting live from Gulf Coast State College in the Education Encore program. Give yourself a round of applause, guys. It's a big moment. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. So uh, we are we are broadcasted live. I'm excited. Uh, I know you're excited. And wait till you see uh, who I have on the show for you today. I just realized I can put my mask on. So... <laughs> I was breaking all the COVID rules there uh, at the college, so shame on me. But uh, I, I don't know. Do I look like a superhero? I feel like a superhero when I wear this mask. <laughs> right. I, I, you know, I feel like I'm going to save democracy if we know it. Uh, I'm pretty excited about it. <laughs> so before we do that, guys, I want to tell you about our sponsor. We have a sponsor, uh, as you know, that does all of our graphics, and they help us out with our, with our website and our marketing and things like that. And they made us a commercial, so we're going to start off with that so you can kind of see because uh, they've got something special for all of you guys out there. So here we go. Hey, guys. This is Judah with Edge Digital Agency. We want to offer something special to the friends and family of Gagnon Antillier, our digital diagnostic. In this free consultation, we equip you with the tools and strategies you need to maximize your online impact. For example, your website needs to wow customers and serve them well, but it also needs to rank high on search engines like Google, and that's exactly what we're going to do. Visit us today at edgedigital.agency, and when you reach out, make sure to mention that you saw us on one of Tim's videos. Thank you so much for your time, and we look forward to hearing from you. That's right, guys. Ed Digital dot agency. Who knew there was a dot agency? That's something new that I, I knew about. I didn't know about that. Did you know about that? No, no one here knew about that. But apparently there is a dot agency. So if you go to Edge Digital dot agency, they can help you out with all kinds of stuff and tell them that the Gagno Atelier sent you. And uh, with that said, guys, let's get the show on the road because I am very, very pumped. Uh, we have got with us uh, two collectors uh, that have got such a great story. And when you hear about their collection and the way that they support artists and in particular women artists, uh, you know, the dad in me, I've got a lot of daughters in my house and I live in a sea of estrogen. And um, with, yeah, I know I would laugh about that. It's true though. I'm just treading water in a sea of estrogen. I tell, I still, I, I tell my stepson, just keep your head down. Just keep your head down, man. <laughs> so, but uh, so with that said, let's bring them on. I'm going to turn off my solo, and there we are. We have Steve Bennett and Dr. Elaine Schmidt. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you, Tim. We're delighted to be here. Thank you very much. All right. Now, you guys are the founders of the Bennett Art Collection, which, is, which it just sounds fancy and exciting. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds so sort of like, you know... <laughs> So tell us a little bit about what that is. The Bennett Art Collection. Well, I, we started collecting about uh, 9, 10, 11 years ago. And uh, we have amassed a, a group of paintings that uh, all are uh, paintings by women of women. And that's the, uh, that's the entirety of the collection. So what... What this collection contains is works by both uh, contemporary painters, uh, that being people who are still alive, and historic women painters being people who have a place in art history but who are no longer with us. And so we've, we've got painting, the earliest painting in the collection is uh, from 1640, and the last painting in the collection was done um, what, two months ago, eight, eight weeks, 10 weeks ago, and everything in between. And we have about 200 paintings total, and we continue to acquire uh, eight, 10, eight, 10 paintings a year. Oh, wow. Fantastic. Now, what was the catalyst that made you decide? Because I, I, from, from looking at your website, I'm going to call up your website here right now. 
uh, the Bennett Art Collection.com and the Bennett Prize. We're going to be talking about that as well uh, coming up here. But what was the catalyst that made you decide uh, to go with, first of all, female artists, but then also figurative art? What, what was the reason that you chose to do that? I think we, I think it was our sense, and you will tell me if I'm wrong. <laughs> I think it was our sense that the women weren't getting uh, an appropriate amount of uh, attention as artists, both historically and in, in present terms. And uh, we thought that figurative realism, we don't object to abstract art. We think abstract art has a place as well, but we thought that figurative realism wasn't being taught or promoted to the extent it should be. So we felt like we could do two good things. We could promote women as artists and we could promote figurative realism as a genre. And I liked the narrative behind figurative realism. Yeah, we both like narrative painting very much. Right. Yeah, there's something there's some, some, something about a narrative painting that just, you know, it's like watching that story be told and, and the way the artist exemplifies that and, and, and tells what they're trying to say. It's beautiful. So with that said, I mean, it's what kind of an impact has that had um, uh, for female artists? I mean, it seems to me that it would be a pretty empowering thing uh, for for a, a, a woman artist to be a part of your collection. I don't know. <laughs> well, we hope so. <laughs> That's fair. We hope so. Uh, let's put it this way. We have a number of artists that contact us seeing if they could find their way into the collection. Um, we, uh, we have been pleased to see a number of the artists whom we've promoted and collected um, do very, very well to see their career. It's always a gratifying thing to see the careers of uh, the people you collect take off. And a number of the women that uh, uh, came into the collection early have now come into, come into their own right. Now, whether that's a function of the, uh, of the collection doing it or just part of a, you know, Maybe it says something, we have a good eye and we can spot people before they hit the big time. I'm not sure, but we've been very gratified that a number of the artists in the collection are uh, very popular and well-known, now at least, well-known figures. Those, for the, those who are living, those who are dead, for the most part, they either were or they weren't when we acquired the work. We, when we buy a painting, um, Lots of times we'll reach out to the artist and ask them, you know, what they had in mind when they were actually painting. And so some artists like to have kind of an email relationship. And uh, and that has, we have people we would now call friends uh, that we've been interacting with over the past decade. And as Steve said, it's, it's very exciting to see people thrive in their career and become well known and to see them in magazines and um, it gives us a lot of joy. Oh, it's very exciting. And we get to know, you know, we get to know people and where they're coming from and what makes them tick. And so it was that whole uh, personal aspect of our collecting that led us to create the Bennett Prize. Uh, once we came to see some of the struggles of uh, painters, all artists struggle. The women, I think, uh, have tended to have struggles peculiar to them. You have a, a single mom that's uh, working two jobs and trying to paint at night. And uh, it was at that point, I think, when we got to know the stories of these artists that we, uh, we decided that uh, one of the ways in which we could propel the career uh, the careers of women figurative realists was to start a prize that uh, honored women figurative realist painters exclusively. And that's what the Bennett Prize does. And for your, for your audience, if the Bennett Prize uh, is, is a competition that's held once every two years among women figurative realist painters. It selects uh, 10 finalists uh, based on solely on the uh, submission of their work. 
And from the finalists, there is one winner selected and that winner gets $50,000 over a two year period uh, to mount there to paint and then uh, provide to us their work. We don't keep the work, but we show the work as part of a traveling exhibition that travels the country along with the work of the finalists. So that uh, that exhibition travels the country. And in fact, um, uh, the Bennett Prize exhibition is current. Is it currently on view? I think it's currently on view at the Scarphone, the Scarphone Hartley Museum at the University of Tampa, uh, which is the home to Annika Ingold, who was the first winner of the prize. Oh wow, that, that's, that's on cool. that's on exhibition now uh, in Tampa. Who wants to take a road trip to Tampa? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> the whole world is like, yes, let's go. <laughs> road trip to Tampa. That's what six hours, six hours away. Six hours away. So let's go. Uh, you could you you could do an up and back. <laughs> you could do an up and back. Yeah, it would be you an up and back. Yeah, it wouldn't be too bad. That'd be a fun one. Yeah. So what was um when you were talk to us about how you find artists. Like how do you find uh, an artist that you want to collect or how do you, I mean, mind you at this point, a lot of artists you, you mentioned are contacting you, but when you were first starting out in, 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 in your collection, how did you find artists? How did you decide what artists you wanted to, to contact to, to uh, be a part of your collection? Um, we both like to read. So we do internet research, we read magazines. Um, we, before COVID, we would go to art galleries, art shows. We always went to Art Basel. Um, just, we look- at we're, we're, on the, we're on the make all the time. <laughs> I, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know what else to say. We're on the make all the time. We, we have a list of people we would like to collect that we haven't collected yet. We also try to, if if we like an artist, we try to buy two of their pieces, um, or, more. or more. But at least two. Not everybody, but you know, we look to buy two because you get a, a better feel for the breadth of that artist's skills and who they are. One painting is one snapshot. Two is two snapshots. So you have a a, a, big, a bigger view of them. Yeah, I think. Uh... On my uh, desktop, I have a file, and the file says, all capital letters, the list. And <laughs> the list is all the artists we've seen and liked, and liked well enough to consider putting in the collection. So we look at the list, and we look at the work from those artists, and we kind of, and, and so, you know, pretty soon over a period of time, you develop a network. So the network is uh, gallerists, auction houses, uh, publications, uh, online, online sources. You know, one of the first sources, uh, there used to be a, a blog spot post called uh, Women Painting Women. And it was started by uh, several, two or three, I think three women figurative realist painters who wanted to talk about their work and the work of the women they knew who were doing similar work. And we studied that, we studied that uh, blog very carefully in the early days. And uh, still, yeah, it was very helpful to us in kind of getting the lay of the land. And Instagram and Facebook too. We Wonderful. both yeah. follow Wonderful. artists that we like, and um, sometimes we find paintings on online social media. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you about that. What? How has social? How has social media influenced the way that you find artists? I mean, because at least from my experience, you know, Instagram especially has become the place for artists to to really show their work. And there are many artists. Uh, we had a guest on our show, uh, Sheila Smith. She's not in a gallery anywhere, but you know, she, and, and may not need it. Uh, she, it. She, she she makes three times what I do. I'm like I'm so proud of her. But uh, yes, yeah, she is exclusively uses social media to drive traffic to her Etsy store, where she contacts her her patrons and and sells her work. And so 
you know, that was my question is how has social media, you know, is that become, uh, is that become, especially obviously with COVID, you can't go anywhere. So um, social media is probably the only way you can look at art right now. But um, what's the percentage, would you say, of like, say, magazines and going to galleries versus social media to find artists for you? Oh, I think Instagram is the is the play. I mean, if you look at Instagram, uh, Twitter and fixed websites as kind of the, the test, uh, Instagram has got to be 60 percent uh, of 60% of it today for living artists who are trying to promote their work, I'd say it, it could easily be 60%. Um, that being said, uh, uh, galleries still have a role to play, and we do talk to galleries and gallerists. Um, and sometimes like, if a gallerist knows that we're interested you know, in women artists painting figurative realism, they'll even send us their catalogs from their shows, which is helpful. Yeah, and that's helpful. We, we welcome that. But if you were giving advice to practicing artists, one of the things I think you would say is Instagram, being on Instagram and showing uh, what you're working on, what your work looks like, what you're thinking is. I have tended to uh, discourage people from showing work in progress because I think it, uh, Un unless they have a private group of artists where they're seeking advice, uh, work in progress, I think kind of showing that uh, development of a piece tends to reduce the ta-da uh, factor that comes with unveiling a painting when it's completed. But having said that, I think, you know, any practicing artist today, if they hope to make uh, a dent, they have to be doing it using Instagram. I Instagram, uh, number one, Facebook, number two, Twitter, I don't think uh, registers quite as readily in the uh, art space, but you got to have a presence in at least two of those three. Excellent. Excellent. Those are great points, great advice for artists. So how did you guys get started doing this? I mean, what was the catalyst? Whose idea was it? It was Steve's <laughs> idea. We, uh, we had a condo with nothing on the walls. Uh -huh. and, and so we went through, he used to be a professional photographer. So we thought maybe we would put his photos up. And then uh, Steve has a Czech background and, and Czechoslovakian stamps are absolutely beautiful. So we thought about blowing them up and making them into posters. And then we started to look and read about artists and uh that's when steve suggested he said well what do you think of figurative realism and very narrowly done by women and that's how we started it mm -hmm. was his idea uh, yeah but, but we agreed we did agree we did <laughs> agree we did we didn't disagree we agreed and uh so yes that's that's all true so we uh we made a conscious decision um to collect paintings by women and to do so uh, uh, with a figurative, figurative realist focus. And I don't think we've ever once regretted or, or tried to rethink that decision at all. Sometimes we'll see paintings we love that are done by men, but, and even though we're tempted, we don't yeah, succumb. Because well, once you lose your discipline, you lose your discipline. So. Yeah. That's, that's true. With all the kids I have, that's a fact. <laughs> yes, <it is. laughs> once you once you get in, you're toast. <laughs> Can't do it. Yeah. Can't yeah. do it. You cannot do it. Well, let's show some of your some of the pieces. I've got three uh, artists from your collection um, that that uh, that that jumped out at me, and okay. so let's go ahead and take a look. You can tell us a little bit about these artists, but also. Um, you know, maybe how, how you found them and also, you know, just tell us a little bit about, about this piece and what it means to you guys. Here's the first one. Mary Jane Ansel, HMS Invincible. Yeah, that's her. Uh, Mary Jane is a, uh, a wonderful figurative realist painter from England. Uh, and she, uh, she does these uh, figurative paintings of women uh, and the women are usually uh, 
projecting some kind of connection to patriotic or military uh, garb uh, from the United Kingdom. So the HMS Invincible, of course, was uh, one of the great ships of the Royal Navy. And this young woman is wearing a cap. The, the sailors in the Royal Navy wear a cap with the name of their, uh, of their ship embroidered on the band of the cap and she's uh, wrapped in a Union Jack. And the painting, I think, is probably about two feet high and foot and a half wide. You have the dimensions there, yeah, 23 by 15. 23 by 15, yes, sir. Yeah. She paints on aluminum and she puts oil on aluminum and uh, the paintings look like they're done in egg tempera. They have no impasto. They're very smooth, uh, the, the, finish that's created by aluminum is uh, uh, it, it, the way she does it is perfectly smooth and almost looks printed onto the uh, onto the aluminum. Uh, she's very well known. Uh, she's represented by the RJD gallery in, uh, in uh, New York. And uh, we had followed her for some years. She Actually, she came to our attention. She appeared on the cover. One of her works appeared on the cover of the American Art Collector magazine and really caught our eye. And then, uh, and then this painting came available. I am told that uh, after we acquired this one, apparently there was a line forming at the gallery. And I think she ended up doing three or four variants variants of this particular painting wow because it, it was in such high demand yeah good yeah yeah that, it, it is absolutely beautiful and, and i paint on aluminum as well there's nothing like it once you paint on an aluminum panel it's it's hard to ever go back to canvas or, or anything else and um yeah there it's just it's just a fun thing to paint on and this painting is absolutely just stunning um well let's look at this next one this next one is one of my art heroes. Uh, I've been following her career as well as her husband's since I was in high school. And uh, here we go. We have Miss Julie Bell. Oh, oh God. Muses. Yes. I see, I see, I see Dr. Schmidt just lit up like a Christmas tree. Did you see it? <laughs> yeah, well, we've gotten to know Julie and Boris, and uh, they are just such wonderful people. Great folks. They're great people. They live in um, Pennsylvania, and they're both phenomenal artists, as you said. And actually, Boris did, was it cartoon? Uh, fantasy. Yes, he's, he's, I found him by reading Conan the Barbarian comic books. <laughs> yeah, that's that's for us. So he yeah. Julie was his model early yeah. on. Yeah, I, I know. Yeah, yeah, it's exciting. Matt and she um, learned how to paint by watching him paint, but I think he also, you know, there uh, gave her some hints, and they actually uh, we did a studio visit. They share one studio. And they're across the room from each other, and they talk back and forth while they paint, which is very interesting to us. Yeah, we enjoyed that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, Julie's work has evolved since we met her. I curated an art show about five years ago, um, and she was chosen, mm -hmm. and we, we bought the piece. Yes, that's right. And that's how we got to know her. And... I don't know, she does these fabulous animals and she also does illustrations for children's books. Mm -hmm. And they also do um, commercial advertising. Uh, in addition to in their addition fine art. In addition to their yeah. fine art. They're, they're really in they're the most down to earth, nicest people. She sent us, we, I like to cook and she likes to cook. And so recently she sent me two pounds of, of beans from the Mennonite shop that she had been out in. Oh, wow. She's just really, a, they're just good people. You couldn't meet nicer people. That The ham cassoulet was terrific, <laughs> let me tell you. The ham cassoulet was fabulous. Uh, yeah, she uh, she is she is just, you know, one of those artists. And again, I discovered them when I was in high school. And uh, I remember the first time I saw her art, she had done 
some artwork for Marvel Comics, painting yeah. superheroes. Yeah. And it was one of those things where it was like seeing your, your superhero heroes, but they looked real. It, it just caught my eye and it caught my attention as, as a young man, uh, dreaming to be a comic book artist and other things. And seeing her art, it just changed everything. Her, her and her husband, Boris, they just they had a huge impact uh, on my career as an artist. And I've always uh, been a great admirer of her work. And uh, she has been translating a lot, transferring a lot to animal art, as you, as you, as you said, and just absolutely stunning. And uh, I've always liked her ethereal fantasy type of artwork that she, that she has in her work that's just beautiful. Uh, so let's show one more. Um, I think you guys, and then this woman is actually uh, a jury for the Bennett Prize, uh, Alyssa Monks. And this painting, I, we just got some ooh and ahs from the audience, uh, from the classroom, so that's yeah. good. <laughs> this yeah, is a you, powerful piece. You, you can speak. Yes, I, I love this painting. It's, it's in my office. Um, she, she did a TED Talk, University of Indiana, and she talked about how she had taken some time off from painting because her mother was dying of cancer and she went to take care of her mother. And this painting was painted during that period. Um, some people journal to deal with their grief and Alyssa painted. And she actually has like two periods. Before this, most of her work was of women in showers. And it would be the shower door and the reflection of the woman. Then she did this one, and now she does, like, it's a little more abstract, but it's women kind of blended with trees and nature and ecology. So I I feel very, I feel fortunate that we own this painting because I feel like this is kind of the bridge between her two phases of work. And when we purchased it, my mother was also dying. So it was, for me, still a, a special painting. Hmm. Yeah, it's and this is powerful stuff, and uh, you know we we don't collect anything we don't love. We you know <laughs> we we frequently get questions about uh, investment. A lot of people want to ask questions about investment, making money, being an art collector, and <clears throat> that's not really been our game. I think we probably have made some investments that. Uh, paintings that you buy low and they're worth more when you own them. But uh, generally speaking, that hasn't been our direction. Um, but uh, Alyssa and Julie and Julie Bell and Boris Vallejo, I mean, you're talking about uh, iconic, iconic painters, uh, you know, uh, for an audience of a certain age, <clears throat> thinking back to Marvel Comics or DC or any, uh, there was a period of time in the late 60s, early 70s when um, it was Boris Vallejo, Frank Frazetta, and Richard Corbin were kind of the big three yes. science fiction fantasy illustrators. And then Julie Bell uh, came onto the scene. Um, uh, you know, those are those are people that have a very clear place in art history, as do these other women. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Alyssa Monks, uh, her current work is kind of a mixture of nature and the female figure. And the work is just stunning. It's just very, very amazing. Well, one of the things that, that that touched me, you know, when, when we were when we were showing um, is the the connection, the the Dr. Schmidt you were talking about, and my buddy Matt Tommy from Thriving Christian Artists. Um, one of the things he always says is that nobody buys art because they can afford it or they can't afford it. They don't buy it for that reason. They buy art for connection. And art has this powerful way where you as the viewer of the patron of the purchaser of the art, you see that piece and you have an emotional, powerful, deep connection with the artist through that piece of art. 
and it touches you in a way that really there are no words to. And the art is powerful in that way. And it brings people together in such a beautiful and such a such a deep, deep level. And the minute I brought that painting on the screen, I saw it in your face. And when you were talking about it, I saw that. When we when we brought up Julie Bell, her picture, same thing. When 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 watching y'all's reaction i went deep south there did you see it the the, the french canadian yankee I just went deep south there. Uh, <laughs> but when i saw when i saw your reactions to each piece i could see when when julie bell's painting came up and then uh, then you know you talked about you didn't talk about the painting you talked about the relationship that you have with them and that's so that 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 just blesses my socks off because that to me is what it's all about. And then when you when I, when I when I brought up Alyssa's painting, you talked about your mother, and, mm -hmm. and all over clamped and and it was beautiful. And that's what it's that that's that that's really I think the the real reason why people collect art. And, and I think that that's the reason people want to collect art. Um, it's not about the value and it's not, if you, to me, if you're doing it for the investment, that's the wrong reason to do it. And, and what I saw just now with, with, with you guys, that to me is what's so beautiful about the relationship between the artist and their patrons. We, we certainly, uh, I think feel a spiritual connection to the artist through the work and uh, I don't think we have a single a single painting that doesn't speak to us in some way like that. Uh, and frankly, that's one of the reasons why figurative realism is different. Figurative realism, let's face it, it is different than abstraction uh, because how many times have we been in <clears throat> an art museum or an art gallery and you have these people looking at this piece of abstract art and one turns to the other and says can you explain this to me and, uh, <laughs> what, what, what is what's going on there what does that mean and the beauty of figurative realism is there may still be an explanation, but frequently people have enough sense to be able to intuit their way to a general idea about what is happening. And, uh, and frankly, that experience can be very deeply personal. Uh, your mother, I mean, that, that, that painting evokes that, that period of time and, and that life. And that is where the, power of art resides in that ability to touch our souls. Absolutely. That, that, that really, that explains it all. And that, that, that's one of the reasons why I'm a figurative artist is I want to, you know, I, I, I'm always trying to figure out how can I explain this or how can I share this or how can I express what I'm trying to say? And there's just something about the figure. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. And you're right. You know, there were many years, where artists that were my age and older, you couldn't make a living as a figurative painter unless you worked in the commercial art world, you know? And then Photoshop came along and, and took that away, <laughs> you know? And it's like, you know, I, I think guys like Ricky Mujica who did romance novel covers, you right. know? Uh, now, if you go to a bookstore, those are all Photoshop conglomerate images that have been built in Photoshop from photos and, and movie posters, you know, um, um, and, and, and we're, we're in some ways poorer for it, because if you look at, you look at the work of the great, uh, pulp, uh, the, the pulp book, uh, illustrators, Ricky, yeah. Mojica, Ricky Mojica is one, but you know, there were a whole series of these guys, Gil Elvgren, uh, the, that did kind of cheesecakey uh, calendar illustrations and so forth. Those came right out of their imagination. Exactly. Uh, and and so you got a chance when you looked at that to kind of get. They obviously read the book and then they take what the book created in their head and they translate it into a snapshot and. Uh, that's very genuine. 
and it's very human and it gives them insight into what one person's uh, vision or internal experience of that book or uh, scene was. And uh, I think we lose some of that with uh, mechanical techniques, Photoshop, sampling, uh, uh, suddenly that deeply personal part of it is degraded somewhat. Yeah, I, I would agree. And there are now, there are many, many, many digital artists that are doing digital paintings. Um, so that's where the technology has grown enough now where, my goodness, the, the, the digital art that, that is out there now is just as, just as beautiful as any, any piece of art uh, that, that's an oil painting, for example, traditionally. So it's like things are, things are, the more things change, the more they stay the same, but boy, things are changing fast uh, in the art world with, with the, with the, with the advent of technology just growing so much. But let, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about, let, give us some advice on somebody who may be considering starting to collect art. You know, what, what are some of the advice that you would give uh, some of our viewers in, in our classroom here, if they may be considering you know what? I want to buy some art. Where do I go? What do I do? You know, how do I get started? Give us some advice on that. We were just talking about this. I think you first of all decide what you personally really like, and it can be uh, photographs. It could be pastels. It could be oils. It could be sculpture, prints, prints, uh, charcoal drawings whatever you really like, and you might like an eclectic a mix. approach, you know? Sure. And then in your head, develop a budget. And um, like I used to collect, I love uh, gardens and flowers and, and I, so I had a, a small collection of photographs, professional photographs that had been done in Europe, and like the little courtyards with the flowers. And that's at the time I was the school principal, and that's what I could afford. And I loved my little collection. It, it um, hung in my kitchen and made me happy. And so I think you decide what what you love. And um, yeah. like I went to it was the Ann Ar Ann Arbor in Ann Arbor, Michigan. They have a uh, a fair in the summer, or they used to, they always have, but it's real high quality art. You know, some of the stuff there was thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. And, but I would go there with my sister and we would um, walk up and down and I would buy one every year. And like I said, it was, and then, then for me also, as you say, art, it was associated with a memory, you know, like, well, I bought this here. Sometimes that's important too. Um, if it associates with you a positive memory or a trip or something, which is why they always sell art on cruise ships, right? Because you have positive memories and you <laughs> want to have something tangible yeah. as a remembrance for it. And um, you know, cool. that's okay too, as long as you know, as long as you know what you're buying. I wouldn't suggest buying on the cruise ships because they're always overpriced and junky, but, <laughs> but, but some places are great. Right? Yeah. I, I, you know, if I was giving this advice, I think mine's very similar to yours and that would be uh, collect what you love. You know, a lot of people spend too much time. I think Americans, especially, uh, they tend to think about, am I paying too much? And will I make any money? And I knew a fellow once and, he would buy art and then every week he was going online to see if the value of the art had increased. He would buy prints and then he'd follow the value of these prints and so forth. That's sort of like checking the value of your portfolio every day. It'll drive you crazy. Don't do that. Uh, collect what you love and love it for what it is. And, uh, you know, Look, if you're going to be a professional collector slash investor, well, then you need, then you're going to need spreadsheets and graphs, and you got to have a subscription to Art Price to follow what the directionality of the artist's work and so forth. You don't have to do any of that. If you want to be a successful collector, think of what you like, and then 
set a budget and acquire in the budget what you like and hang it up and put it where you want, where you can see it and love it and enjoy it. And don't let your heirs, your executor, your let whoever's going to sort it out when you go figure out what to do with it after you're gone. But just love it while you're here, really. That is some great, great advice. Uh, I think that that really, and that goes back to what we talked about earlier about, you know, if you're collecting it for financial reasons, that's, you know, that's the wrong reason. It's about how the art makes you feel and about the emotion, emotional connection. It's all about connections at the end of the day. You know, I always tell my, uh, I always tell my, uh, my children, I have taught them this th their whole lives. They, they, they got to the point where they hate when I say it, but I tell them um, relationship is the highest form of currency. Indeed. You know, and it's like that is more important than anything. And that will get you things that money can't buy. And it's better anyway. <laughs> so, and that, and that's really what you're talking about with your collection, you know, um, like with Dr. Schmidt, you said that painting is in your office. So you get to see it every time you're in there every day. And so that that's really, you know, I, I think you guys are like, wow. So you have none, none of Steve's uh, photos in the house or <laughs> is it everybody oh, else? Used to have, uh, I used to have, but not now. No, well, the art's kind of crowded out my photographic career, I'm afraid. Uh, and <laughs> that's okay. Uh, you know, that was then and this is now. Right. Uh, but. Uh, you know, we we live in an art gallery or an art museum, and we love every minute of it. We can walk around our house and be uh, thrilled with the things that hang here. So very satisfied with it. Nice. Now, do you have a particular piece of art that you would say is like maybe you have a favorite, maybe she has a favorite? Do you, is there do you have like a particular piece that you're that you find yourself always drawn back to in your collection? Oh, there's a bunch of them. I think, uh, you know, one of the problems with it is that when you when you buy it and live with it, you know, this, this dance goes on between the uh, collector and the piece. And so, you know, your feelings about the pieces, uh, they get deeper. They're sort of like uh, cheese or wine, you know, they improve with age. Uh, uh, you know, I think uh, we've been very careful not to name favorites because that kind of raises one up above the others. But I, th I think it's fair to say, you know, we're constantly changing what's on the walls and falling in love all over again. The work is always shifting. Uh, and that's, that's good for us. The one thing I will say is that we each curate our own office. Well, you know, if you think about it, when you're in a relationship, right, you have to negotiate where everything else goes. So we each can do our own office however we want. And see, Steve is uh, more prone to change things out. I'm more prone to just say, oh, I love this. It's going to stay there. And with our own spaces, we have the right to do what we want to. Yeah. That's Great. It's good for our marriage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You curate your space. And our tastes are a little different. I, you know, I, I wouldn't overstate it, but, you know, it's a Venn diagram where there's some overlap, but there's still this part on the edges that's personal to us. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like edgier work than Elaine does. And Elaine likes uh, romantic realism, women, children, nurturance, uh, this sort of thing. And I, I tend to like a little more in your face mm -hmm. and and so we you know every every acquisition is a negotiation of one sort or another right right i can imagine so what advice would you give to the artist that is trying to say maybe find patrons i know we talked about being on instagram we talked about you know things like that what advice would you give when an artist is is trying to develop a relationship with a patron um, how would they, you know, what would be the ways to do that? What would be the ways to not do that? Well, uh, one thing that we've, we've had this discussion a lot because we interact with artists all the time. And uh, 
The number one thing is stay in touch. You know, we, we, we've been flabbergasted at the number of times we, we conducted a studio visit a while back. And we said to this artist, keep us informed and send us a price list and uh, show us what's on your easel. And we haven't heard anything. And uh, a failure to stay in touch with people who have expressed an interest in your art is a number one mistake. Uh, the second thing is the, mo the most likely sale uh, an artist can have to a collector is to the collector that's already acquired your work once. I don't think most collectors operate upon the assumption that they're only going to buy one of every artist and not acquire others. I think many collectors, by nature of the collecting process, want to own more than one. So stay in touch with the people who've already acquired your work. Make them fill out a form or a card and give you an email address or an address where you can send stuff, stay in touch. I, I think most artists are their, their own worst enemies when it comes to promoting their work. The other thing I would say is, and I'm, I'm, I don't know what the research says on this, but I'll tell you what I say. Um, put, your, put your price on your paintings on your website. Um, don't say contact the gallery or contact the artist if you're interested. And let me tell you why I feel that way. Like if we know an artist and we're interested in a piece, I don't, I don't want to be the one that has to contact and for them to say what the price is. And Steve and I actually look at the whole square inch, you know, the size of the work, how much, you how much, you paid for the last piece, you assume that it will go up some, but it shouldn't triple in one year, all those kinds of things. And so sometimes I won't write and ask because I don't want to be embarrassed to have to say, no, that's you're off the money. You're off the money. <laughs> and and yet, and so then maybe it's a potential sale that you've missed. But I just not say this is how much it is. Yeah. The other the other thing I think that's very important and that we talk about a lot. Um, bad photography yes. will ruin good art. Yeah. We, we oh, in the Bennett Prize uh, competition, we've seen where people think that if they take a cell phone photo in a dark room and that'll convey it, it's cheap, it's easy, it's fast. Uh, that's terrible. Put your work in the best light. And if you're going to post it online or you're going to send it to somebody, either teach yourself to do professional level photography or hire somebody to do it. Because if the photograph of the work's bad, it doesn't matter how good the work is. Nobody's going to be able to tell it. That's a great that's a great point, which uh, which is a good plug for uh, our video on our YouTube channel, the Gagno Atelier YouTube channel how to photograph your artwork. Three <laughs> minutes. There you go. So we actually have a question. So I'm going to turn the camera around and we have Laura here. She's going to ask you a question. Go ahead. Hi. Hi. I, nice to meet you folks. And thank you so much for what you do because I think that's just a real uh, blessing for everybody to have that are aspiring to do art. And uh, I love your theme. I love the idea of realist and women, and I just think that's awesome. Thank you. The, question, the question I have is your backgrounds, you're a photographer. Do you go into, do you use your photography background to kind of identify skill and, and maybe what appeals to you more, whether it's more organic, whether it's staged, the painting? Do you think that that comes into play when you're choosing your art? Uh, the, the answer for me is yes. I, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm a very visual person. Actually, my, I was only a commercial photographer for about five years and, uh, uh, I went on to something else, but I have a bachelor's degree in art history and, um, uh, those experiences and abilities always inform the way in which you judge 
you know, we look at composition. Uh, we look at uh, the way in which something is framed. I think both of us do that. And you don't have to have training. You can do it intuitively and have a sense for it. But yes, I think the background, uh, certainly uh, the uh, visual art background plays a role in how you assess artwork. And we do look at color values and uh, composition and framing. And, you know, one of the things I always want to know when I look at a piece of art, I always look at where is the visual center of the painting, which is another way. It isn't necessarily the geographic or the uh, diametric uh, center of the painting. It's the, it's the spot where your eye lands. So when you look at it and you stop, where does your eye land? And that makes a big difference in whether a work is powerful and successful or not so successful. So just taking the painting behind me as an example, um, it's very well composed because those two women, when you look at them, your eye is focused by the second lighter square appearing in the background behind them. And so your eye is forced to look at those two women, women in the face because the long gray strip to the side forces your eye to the center of that lighter square. And that sort of thing matters to us. Uh, it certainly matters to me. And I think it matters to you. We and pay attention to that stuff. number of figures in a piece, too. Sure. How many figures you have, that matters also. Thank you so much. I appreciate your answer. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you. Excellent. So real quick, uh, we've got just a few more minutes left here. Um, when, you're, when you are... Um, getting ready for it. Now the Bennett, the Bennett prize that you do is that, when is that next coming up? The call for entries. Go yeah. ahead. Yeah, we both, we're both, we're both like Pavlov's <laughs> dog here. We'll get the point. <laughs> we're in the midst of the call for entries right now and it closes October the 16th uh, at what? 11.59 Mountain Standard Time. <laughs> oh, wow, good coming up soon. Soon. Yeah. And, um, then the 10 finalists will be announced at the end of November and then the winner uh, next May. At hopefully, it will, it will, it will be in Muskegon, Michigan at the Muskegon Art Museum. Don't Whether worry. or not it's in per person or not yeah. is yet to be determined. I think we open in March, don't we? Yeah. May? May. Okay, I'll take your word for it. Right. Yes. Uh, well, that would be great. We'll have to have you two back on the show when that happens. We would be, we'd be excited to be able to share the finalists because one thing um, from the prize, and you would know this because you're an expert, but people sometimes assume figurative realism looks one way and it's across the spectrum, you know, yeah. different yeah. styles and it's uh, quite beautiful. Well, the other thing is every jury is different. So if you're a would-be contestant for the Bennett Prize, look at our collection. That's one kind of very broad gauge, but look at look at what was successful last time. You know, I some people that I don't think paid attention said, well, the Bennett Prize is for for photographic realists or super realists. And it's really not so. No, none of the work that was selected last time was super realist uh you know there's a lot we're very broad-minded when it comes to defining figurative realism right is it a human figure can you tell it's a human figure right you know that that's pretty much good enough for us <laughs> right yeah and, and there is such a broad thing you know you have you have artists like you know uh shane levinson who is hyper realistic you know and, and then, then nobody does lace better What's that? I'm sorry. Nobody does lace better than Shane. Nobody knows. Nobody, no, does, nobody can paint well, lace. With her. I was in. I was at. Uh, we were both at the Academy of Art University together, and oh, you know, we all love to hate her. <laughs> 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 she was just so good, and uh, yeah, just so proud to see her grow. You know, but then you have her on one end, and then 
you have, say, a Michelle Dunaway who has a much more painterly, very, very brush strokes, very ethereal look to her artwork. They're both figurative artists of, of absolute, you know, stunning quality, but very different. And there's everything in between. And then you can go even more radical than, than, than both of those on either spectrum. So you are absolutely right. And, and that's one of the, the, the things that I just love the most about uh, figurative art. Uh, of course, it's my thing. So yeah, I like figurative art. <laughs> we, we get it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And that, that, that's a beautiful thing. Well, I just want to say thank you guys for coming on. Uh, do you have any other, like, any other um, closing remarks you'd like to make before we go? If you want to collect, dive in. And frankly, don't be afraid. Let your taste drive your decisioning. And the newsletter, you know it. Oh, yes. <laughs> and if you would be good enough, thank you. I, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> what? If you would like to uh, subscribe, we have we have a newsletter that we send out. Uh, go to the go to the Bennett Prize landing page, and it'll ask you for an email address, which we'd be happy to provide. There's on your screen there the BennettArtCollection.com or the BennettPrize.org if you're interested in either of those things. Uh, and if you see something that's exciting or interesting, drop us a line. There's a contact button there and. We, all, we always make it a point to read that stuff. Excellent. Well, I just want to thank you guys for coming on the show. It was a distinct pleasure for me. Uh, I've been following you guys for a while and uh, just enjoying what you, what you do for, uh, for, for the ladies out there that, that are artists. And uh, as, a, as a dad of a lot of daughters, it makes me proud. And girl power, you know. <laughs> okay. and, and thank you for all that you do. Your, uh, your podcast is well-received and well-watched, and we think it's an important addition to the efforts that are necessary to promote art and artists. And we're grateful to you for your work. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Go ahead and stay on the line. I'm going to say goodbye to the audience and I'm going to come back on and say goodbye to you guys. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank, thank you. you. Well, guys, that was a pretty good show. I got to tell you, I was excited about it. Uh, with that said, uh, we are going to say goodbye to our live audience. And uh, but again, we've got some great stuff coming on here uh, next week. We are going uh, to have Tracy Lee Strum with us, and she is a street art artist, uh, a Modernaro artist. Uh, and so she is the one uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with Modernaro, uh, that is uh, the people that do the street chalk festivals where they draw on the ground and they make those cool 3D things that people can stand on and do all of that. It's pretty darn exciting. So she's going to be coming on and talking to us uh, in the class next week. And then after that, we have got some other fabulous artists. We're going to be interviewing this Tim Gagno is going to be interviewing the other Tim Gagno artists, which is pretty exciting. It's going to be a little weird for both of us. Um, and then uh, we have a paleo artist is going to be coming on. Uh, if you don't know what a paleo artist is, that is dinosaur art. Uh, and paintings of extinct animals, uh, an artist that works with scientists and paleontologists to figure out what these animals actually looked like. So I'm pretty excited about that. And we've got even more than that uh, as we go live from Gulf Coast State College in the Education Encore program. But as usual, everybody, just remember God loves you. So does your old pal, Tim. We'll talk to you next time.